you say well, that must bother you. You're getting older, and and you, you might not live to see some of this that you're talking about. It gets me. And perhaps I, I still, you know, I still have those desires. But when I read, this is life eternal. He's praying for his disciples. This is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So life eternal then is, is knowing God. So my pursuit is to know him more and more, because that's life. And it could be out of this mortal frame will disintegrate if the Lord doesn't. If he doesn't choose some other way, which I know God will have, I believe, a people in the end time to live to a great age. I believe they will. And just step off from there into immortality. I believe that will happen. And I'm not boasting that... Uh, because I believe that, that I will qualify. I'm not saying that. But surely there's something in what the Apostle Paul said and what Jesus said that we can't just brush off for the general day of the resurrection. And he stands before the grieving sisters and there's Lazarus down there in the tomb in their four days. And he tries to comfort Mary and Martha. Your brother will rise again. Oh yeah, we know, Lord. We, we know the scripture. He'll rise again on the last day. At the resurrection. And she said, I am the resurrection. And the life. And that's what Jesus is referring to. He wasn't talking about time schedule. He himself, who is the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Believest thou this? Oh, yes, we believe you're that prophet that came into the world. That wasn't the question. He is the resurrection and the life. And I know that we haven't partaken of that as we ought, and I know God is going to reveal it. He's going to reveal it in end time as he did in the beginnings of the church. He's going to reveal it in end time. I believe in greater power. Paul had a great revelation of it. A great practical outworking of it. And he said, I carry about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. He carries about the dying of the Lord Jesus. Every day, subject to persecution. Sometimes to stone him. Once at least to death. All these guys fired these big rocks at him and he fell down there covered with rock. And they went on their way. Paul got up. Went on his way ministering. Care about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my mortal flesh, in my mortal flesh. And so the resurrection and the life is not only to be revealed in immortality, it's to be revealed in mortality. Paul had a taste of it. I bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Look, this mark here, this is where my, my ribs were crushed in. This is where my eye was crushed out. And you need more marks. Now, why didn't God heal him? I believe he did. Why didn't God heal the wounds of Jesus? He did. But he left those wound marks there as a witness and a testimony of the resurrection life of God Almighty. 
fact that he was dead and is alive again. I think he still has those marks. Because when John saw in the book of Revelation, when they talked about the angel talked, showed him this book that was sealed with seven seals. And the cry went forth, Who is worthy to come forth and open this book and break the seals? And no one moved. No angel, no archangel. No one came forth. So they, they understood the, the impact of the opening of that book. They understood that there was something awesome about it. No angel would stir. No, not one of the departed saints. If they were there at that time, uh, uh, dared to come forth and say, "Yeah, I'll, I'll open it." And John wept. This is so important to John. That you mean there's no one in heaven that's going to open this book, which contains uh, the final. It, talks about the final victory of the Lord Jesus Christ over this universe and all of sin and iniquity. No one here that can open the book and let's hear about it. But the angels said, weep not. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He's overcome. And he will come and he will open the book and loose the seals thereof. I remember this <coughs> minister uh, hearing him, you know, and he said, and so John dried his eyes and he, he looked and said, I want to see this powerful line. And lo, a lamb. Not only a lamb, but a lamb as it had been slain. A bleeding lamb came forward. I took the book and began to open the seals. You know, it's the, it's the most awesome thing that when great kings and dictators or prime ministers or you name it in the earth and the earth has had many of them from as far back as we have recollection and as far back as we have history these potents that potentates that would rise up and lord it over the nation and the ultimate conqueror lion, but he's got the character of the lamb of the tribe of Judah. I mean, the lion of the tribe of Judah got the character of a bleeding lamb. A bleeding lamb. A wounded lamb. Carries those wounds. As a badge uh, of honor. As a medal. God could have healed those hands. No, that's that's no sign of death to him. That's a sign of victory. I suffered that on a cross. Here, Thomas, come and look. He didn't want to even... I mean, he was so dumbfounded, you might say. Jesus, come here. If he had said, I won't believe until I put my finger in his hands and inside. Come here, Thomas. He came forward and he put his finger in Princess is in his hands and in his side and cried out, Oh my Lord and my God. He bears the marks of a bleeding lamb all through the book of Revelation. The lamb has conquered. But that's not all. He's got followers. Followed in that way. God help us to be followers in the way. Knowing even as I speak that that way is going to be very, very hard and difficult. It's not going to be an easy way. Narrow, yes, narrow. Perhaps worse than that. It's going to be filled with many, many dangers. Many temptations, many trials. That, oh, I, I just, <laughs> I, I know sometimes I emphasize those things. 
because we're living in the land of plenty, where we have freedom to gather like this without putting shutters over the windows or locking the doors, that the time might well come. If not in my time, in yours. When it will be as it was in the days of the early church. When because, because of the power of the Lamb on the throne and the message that came forth by the Spirit who represented him in the earth, who spoke of that cross and of that death and of that resurrection, that was the thing that enraged the the governments there in Judea. Kings of the earth risen up against the Lord and against his anointed. They took him on and they crucified him. He rose from the dead and they took him on again. Because though he rose, though he was crucified and put away, he rose from the dead and he ascended, but there was a people on the earth who were in such close contact with him that they were like their master. He took note of the disciples that they'd been with Jesus. What do you mean by preaching this Jesus that we crucified? Peter says, we mean this, that he whom you crucified, God has raised from the dead and has appointed him king of all kings. Before him all people will bow and acknowledge him as Lord of all one day. Repent. And I mean that the Lamb was walking again in the earth in his followers. These are they when John saw this great company ascending Mount Zion. Who are these? These are the overcomers. These are the ones who follow the Lamb which whithersoever he leadeth them. Notice that. These are the ones that follow the lion of the tribe of Judah. No. He's never seen again as the lion of the tribe of Judah. As a, a picture of a lion. Of a, a lion. Twenty-eight times in the book of Revelation he's spoken of as the conquering lamb. The lamb that leadeth his people by the rivers of the living water. The Lamb on the throne that leads the armies of heaven. And the kings and the dictators and the rulers and the whatever they're called in any nation. They're going to know that there's a Lamb reigning on the throne because he's got a, a representative Lamb in the earth in the body of Christ that's prepared to take up their cross and follow him. These are they that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth and loveth not their lives unto the death. Proceeded by saying, they overcame these people, this great crowd. Overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their witness, the word of their testimony. They overcame most of them by dying. Why? Dying for the cause of Christ. By bearing about in their own body the afflictions that Christ bore on the cross. Same afflictions. That which comes from the hatred of men's hearts. Because they don't realize that in doing all that they're releasing they're releasing a people who are filled with the very love of Jesus. The love of Jesus is going to be known as that which is the ultimate victory of God's people. Nothing more powerful. Nothing more powerful than the love of Jesus. You know what apostles and prophets and evangelists and <coughs> pastors and teachers and elders and deacons are in the church for? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come to this stature. You know, people are strange, but we, we know these things, and there's a lot of emphasis on 
fivefold ministry. Uh, I think one man is almost every time you hear him is a fivefold ministry. God setting up the fivefold ministry. Yeah, I know. Yes, along with the old the accompanying ministries, deacons and elders. And doors of mercy and you know you, there's many many different aspects of ministry. And there was a time when I suppose we all wonder well what's my ministry Lord I, I want to fulfill my ministry and that's good but I think teaching has fallen short in this area of reminding such people that no matter what the prophetic utterance might be about your ministry, you only come to that in fullness as you follow the Lord. I don't care if it's the greatest apostle or healing evangelist on earth. If he doesn't follow the Lamb, his ministry might be affected by way of healing people. It won't give him any credit in the courts of heaven if he isn't following the Lamb. And that is pretty awesome and pretty disturbing for some people who might be mighty apostles and prophets and showing the fruits of it. I mean by the fruits of it I mean what they mean by it, that, that they can prophesy true prophecy. They can heal the sick, might raise the dead might perform all kinds of miracles. If they're not following the Lamb, it doesn't qualify them to reign with Christ among them. It doesn't qualify them. So, Lord, we're not saying we're qualified. We're just saying, Lord, if we know these things, God, help us to qualify. By that I mean, God help us to follow, oh, not just the enthroned Christ, but the Lamb. Take up our cross and follow you. But you said we can't be your disciples. Can't be your disciples. Lord, we want to be your disciples. We want to follow you. And God sees the intents of our hearts, and He sees the thoughts of our hearts. And if our thoughts please Him and our desires please Him, He'll answer. And He'll cause us to walk in His way that will bring us to Him. So that's encouraging to know that if our hearts are right, and that's the most important thing. Give all diligence to keep thy heart. Keep it with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That's why we say, Lord, renew my heart and my mind. And I don't know, it's probably a little different there, but renew, Lord, make it new, that we might think with the mind of Jesus, be motivated with the mind of Jesus. But by nature, we don't have that. For thus saith the Lord, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. How much different? As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. Oh, that's a long distance. And so then, how can we ever stand God's Word except we have a bridge between, oh yeah, be nice, I thought it'd be great to be a master of Greek and of Hebrew. And I don't say I set out to do that, I didn't, I just wanted to have a little understanding. Which, when God showed me this, I mean it, I, I don't care if I never know Greek or any more of it, if I come to know Him better. And the Lord seemed to show me when I stopped, stopped uh, worrying about Greek and Hebrew. Uh, the Lord has told me this way. Here's, a, here's English and German and French and Latin and Greek and Hebrew and Chinese and Japanese. And let's see them as the size of this zero here. 
on this cover, separated by, oh, three sixteenths of an inch. And that's the barrier between Greek and English. Eighth of an inch. But the barrier between Greek or German or Japanese and the mind of God is infinite. That's the real barrier. Infinite. So no matter if I could master every language on earth, including the dead languages of Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, if I could master that to perfection, I could read the scriptures, I wouldn't know God. I wouldn't know God. Saul of Tarsus was such a man. I mean, he knew Greek and Hebrew to perfection. I'm sure he did. On occasion, though he spoke Greek or Aramaic, and he started to <coughs> speak in Hebrew, his Hebrew's old, oh, that man, he knows Hebrew. I mean, this is both of them. Probation and Hebrew. He knew it thoroughly. <coughs> Didn't know God. <laughs> the light from heaven shone upon him and knocked him down, blinded him, blinded his eyes that he might, by the light of Jesus, cause him to be in that state of blindness was it for three days totally blind. Gone all his hopes to wipe out the church. <laughs> what have you did it? What's this all about? <laughs> oh, God's ways, you know, so, so far beyond us. He chose the chief persecutor of the church to be the chief, you might say, the chief apostle in the church. God is sovereign. Again, I say I'm not going to get into Calvinism or, or where Calvinism will lead you if you follow it to its utter conclusion. But he's sovereign. He knows what he's doing. And he's doing it right. And in the end, all creation will know everything he did was right. The Lamb rules on the throne and one of these days, and I don't know, next year, the year after, a decade from now, I, and I'm not a prophet. I don't know those things. But he's ready as a bleeding lamb to reveal himself to a bleeding people. And kings and dictators and presidents and archbishops and popes, they're going to no, there's a, a lamb that's angry. They're going to cry out to the rocks and the, of the mountain, cover us, cover us, for the day of the wrath of the lamb has come and we can't overcome him. They're going to cry out that. How are they going to know there's a lamb up there? They don't believe it now. They're going to know there's a lamb reigning. And this lamb people are going around in the earth a lamb people witnessing of him not only by the words they say but by the life they live and they'll well, that's that Jesus people Jesus we see Jesus there crucified in these people it's going to be so real in the earth that the captains and the great men are going to know it so there's a long way for us to go yet. But it doesn't need to take long to get there. But I'm just saying this, I know somewhere along the way, every one of us, if we're true to him, we'll come to the crossroads where, let's see, can I go this way or that way? And until we are, what, how shall I put it, assured in our hearts, and it's settled between our hearts and minds and the Lord Jesus, that, Lord, we're going to follow you wherever you lead us, we'll be tempted to turn aside.
So that's why it's so very important today that this confirmation of the life of Christ in us and the requirement of Christ for a disciple is known. Not that we're going to go out looking for some cross somewhere. But that we know what God wants. But when the time comes, God says, there. Take that cross then. If we've already done it in our hearts and minds, I believe God will have grace in that day to pick it up when it's there waiting for us. Because Jesus takes it away. If we all prepare for him, his heart was fixed. He even said in that closing prayer, well, you might say that closing prayer in the presence of his disciples, John 17. Um, Father, I come to thee. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Well, that was, I forget, a day or two later, two or three days later, when he was hanging the cross. But it's, he was committed. So committed that he could say, Father, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. And now come I to thee. And from then on in that prayer, he was praying for a people, praying for you and I. Not only for these that you have given me here, but for those that will believe on me through their word. I pray for them also. And we need to read John 17 also. Pray for us. It would be one as he was one with the Father. I and them, thou and me. That they might be one in us. And what's the outcome of that? That the world might believe that thou hast sent me. That's the outcome of this union in the body of Christ. It's not a mechanical thing. It's not saying, oh, come on, let's have a great show of unity here. Let's all get together, forget doctrines, all that. Let's get together in this building of 10,000 people and show the world we're one. Nothing to do with that. The people coming to harmony with Jesus. having the same union with Jesus that he has with the Father, then the world will believe. Then there will be a witness in the earth that Jesus was when he was here in one man. Now it will be in a corporate people all over the earth that may never get together as one great crowd but here and there a handful, here and there another handful. Babylon always wants to get all the pieces together. They're not satisfied with the group here that loves the Lord and the group there. Well, uh, that doesn't work. And great church organizations have come up because they said people, they're going to get scattered if they don't do something about this. You've got to have a headship. I'm told that by 100 A.D., and I forget who it was that said, this is the rule of the church. People will submit themselves to the bishop and the bishop to the archbishop. And uh, that was it became an established thing in the church. That the lordship of Christ soon gave way to the lordship of man in the house of God. And I've seen in my short life many organizations, several I can think of, started out with a great flowing of the Spirit of God and in short order there was a, one who was king, one who was recognized as the head over all. And uh, of course there's apostles and prophets under them, but I've seen that in my day. So how can we avoid then uh, getting popularized if we have a great and mighty gift? There's only one way and that's to follow the Lamb. If you're following Him, He'll show you your cross, which could be go lay down your ministry. 
Jack, you did that for a while. Somehow I guess they, I don't know, got back into it. Go, go and take a job. Go work out there in the work sector. I, I'm just saying, it doesn't matter what, but God's so jealous over his people, he will not give his glory to the greatest apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist that ever lived. He won't share his glory with any of them. He's still jealous of his own glory. And he give it all to Jesus. Because in Jesus, he was the son of the Father, the express image of the Father, coming into the earth, sealed with this covenant on his lips. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, and tempt it concerning it. On the Mount of Temptation, tempt it concerning that covenant. You're the Son of God. Here. You're hungry, aren't you? Forty days. Turn that to bread. You can do it. You're the Son of God. People think every time the devil challenges us, we've got to accept the challenge. Oh, no. Jesus wouldn't. He knew the mind of God. He knew what God said. He wasn't going to react to what the devil did. He would only react to what the Father said. God is going to have this true testimony of Jesus in the earth. The same testimony that Jesus was himself when he was here as one man. He's going to have it in a people. Testimony of Jesus, which is better than any, higher order than any prophet. But the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And this prophet that was showing John around in the heavens, one of the prophets apparently that had gone on, we don't know who it was, and but he was so ablaze with the light and glory of God that John thought it was Jesus, and he fell down to worship. He said, no, no, don't do that. I love your brethren. I love your... I'm a fellow of your... What is, how does it put it? I'm of your brethren. And those that have the testimony of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And of those that have the testimony of Those that have the testimony of Jesus. I'm your brethren. Then he mentions the prophets. Then. And of the prophets that have the testimony of Jesus. Jesus Christ. So, apparently he was one of the prophets who had gone on. That was there showing John around. John, twice he was tempted to fall and worship him. Don't do it. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When he says it's the spirit of prophecy, to me it indicates it's far higher than having a gift of prophecy. It's the spirit, the whole, the whole being of, of this prophetic people is the spirit of Christ, the spirit of prophecy. God has a great work in mind in his people. I, I believe it will be in this generation. We don't know that. We, we're not to be concerned about that because it can be in this generation and many are in this generation not, not see it. Not learning about it. These are they that <coughs> keep the testimony of Jesus. These are they that follow the Lamb with us to wherever He goes. Followers of the Lamb. Knowing Him as the way that causes us to know truth. Practical truth. Living truth. Not just theoretical truth. Intellectual truth. Follow him in the way we come to know him who is the truth, the Logos of God, and the life. Well, I think that's it enough. I hope we have helped you heard something from the heart of God that will stay with you. Dear Lord, I thank you. 
Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, you've given me to come here and fellowship with these brethren, brothers and sisters here. Thank you, Lord. Just thank you, Lord. That I, I found it to be refreshing to my own heart. And I think of the time that we were sitting there in the well, Jacob's well, and there came a woman to draw water. And you had words from the Father to give to her. And she went away excited because she had heard the words of one whom she believed to be the Messiah. And the disciples came back with bread because they had traveled a long way. And they were hungry. And he said, they said, here, Master, here's something to eat. And he says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And they said, oh, has someone come and given you something to eat? And he says, my meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. Cause us to know, Lord, that our, our very substance, our very life is, is in doing your will. You didn't say my meat is to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to preach, to prophesy, to cast out devils. My meat is my food is to do the will of the Father that sent me. Lord, bring us to that one thing that David spoke of. Thing that I desired of the Lord. Bring us to that one thing, Lord, that Jesus spoke about. And he spoke about having an eye, one eye, a single eye for your glory. One treasure, not many treasures, but one treasure laid up in heaven. That neither thief or robber or rust could steal or corrupt. One master, not many masters. One master. Knowing that we can't serve two masters. It has to be one or the other. Bring us to that. Where our focus is bright, we have one eye is on one master and on one treasure. But God, we will be, we'll be satisfied, but we cannot be satisfied till you bring us to that. By your grace. Do it with these young people, Lord. Oh God, I know your hands on them, and I pray, Lord, you will keep them always. Lifting up to Jesus. High and lifted up, but we see him not with our physical eyes. Oh God, send forth the light in each one of us. Such a brilliance of the glory of God that we'll see you, Jesus. High and lifted up. See you and keep our eyes on you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Not detracted by anything that you're doing. Not, be de not to be detracted by the gifts that are functioning in people. Or the mighty ministries that are there in the land. Not to be detracted by it, but yet not despising them or thinking we're superior. Thanking you for every good and perfect gift you've given, Lord. But let it not detract us from our... Give us, don't give us those crossed eyes, Lord. That we can't see clearly. Give us an eye that is single. Focus upon you. An exalted one, high and lifted up. And may we then, as we proclaim Christ, have that Oh, that ministration the apostle had to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Make them see. Oh, do it, Lord, with any kind of gimmicks that we have. But, Lord, to have a ministration of light that will cause men to see. Do it, Lord, we pray for this group here every morning and every evening. Thank you. Keep lifting us in your name. To the author and the finisher of our faith. That in the days to come, when 
There's a lot of trouble in the land, my boy. There is now. Oh, God, to be fortified of us. Fortified of that assurance. God, you sent us, and you sent us in this generation. And you promised that in the greatness of the evil, no matter how great it was, there'd be more grace. Sin and iniquity abound. You said there'd be more grace. It could abound beyond that. We pray, Lord, that you would do that for your name's sake. Put that burden on the hearts of all of us, Lord, more and more. The burden that Isaiah had. That his watchman on the walls, we will not be able to rest or take our peace, Lord, till the righteousness of Zion goes forth as brightness and the salvation of us a burning lamp. A message, yeah, but more than that, a burning lamp. That's your burden. You declared through the prophet, for Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, for Jerusalem's sake I cannot rest. For the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Thank you for the burden of your heart. We accept the burden of your heart, Lord, when you lay it upon us, but Make us worthy to receive that burden through no worthiness of our own, but by coming into the yoke of Christ, which he bids us to do. He carries only the burden of the Father, none other. We want to come into that yoke so, oh, so thoroughly, Lord, that we have no burden but the one that you lay upon us. Look upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Beautiful. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.